Can you hear me in Zoom? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Hey friends, it's 2 p.m. So we are ready to start. Welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. Um, you know, if not, I'm still glad you, you've made it to our second week of CIS 307. Today's agenda is fairly simple. We'll continue talking about decision support systems. So we'll continue with the slides. On Thursday, we'll wrap up our decision support systems discussion. We'll probably do one or two exercises related in relation to group decision support systems. And uh, after that, I will ask you to take quiz based on our decision support systems or DSS lecture that we're covering right now, right? So it will be due by the end of next week, okay? But today we'll just continue with our discussion uh, of decision support systems or DSS, that's about it. Okay, so now I need... Okay, so to continue with our discussion on decision support systems, I will go to our course homepage right here. And I will open our decision support systems PowerPoint slide deck, it's right here. By the way, before we start, I would like to bring your attention to a couple of things, um, or maybe remind you about a couple of things. This lecture is also available in pre-recorded format on YouTube, and this is the link to this lecture if you ever want to go back and review it. Another thing that I've started doing and I announced it, I just want to make sure you remember about it. I, I uh, upload my Zoom recordings to another YouTube channel, okay? And I put that link somewhere here. Yeah, live Zoom lectures playlist on YouTube, okay? So usually right after the class, I upload the recording there. So it's up to you which version you want to view. So I'm giving people like multiple opportunities to... Uh, uh, either review for an exam or to catch up if, if they have to miss a class for a valid reason. And also about this lecture, there is a paper called uh, Decision Support Systems and Business Intelligence Tutorial. So this lecture together with our next lecture of business intelligence is largely based on this white paper, okay? So if you, pr if you prefer to read about those topics, you are also welcome to read this paper. Uh, naturally, all resources have a very big overlap. I would say at least 85, 90% overlap between uh, you know, my pre-recorded lectures, live Zoom recordings, and this paper right here. So we have multiple of channels to cover the same material. But what I will do, I'll go ahead and open the decision support system presentation slide deck, and I'll continue with our lecture. Friends, if you're joining us in Zoom, I'm not good switching back and forth between windows. I need to figure out how to do it quickly. You know, I need to change some settings on those monitors and things like that. But if you have something to say, if you have a question, if you would like to interrupt, then please use your voice because I may not be able to see your chat room message immediately, okay? Now I've graded all, uh, all assignments. I'm talking about assignment one where people give me some feedback about you know, their learning styles, about what works for them, what doesn't work for them. And one of the things that many people, not at least a few people have mentioned is that they hate being called on randomly in class, like with questions, right? Uh, now I told those people that I, I usually don't call on people unless they're not paying attention. Like if somebody, if I see somebody is like checking email or something like browsing Facebook, then I may ask them a question, right? to give them like a hint that they need to pay attention. Or if they're disturbing the class to interrupt that habit, you know, to interrupt, interrupt that pattern, that disruptive behavior, I will also ask them a question. So usually I don't do it, right? I don't, like, I don't call on people's names. Now, somebody told me, uh, one of the students told me that he hates it when an instructor asks a question and there's a silence. I hate that too. So to save myself, I may actually call on people, you know, in that situation as well, to make sure we don't have that uh, awkward uh, silence lasting more than, uh, you know, five or 10 seconds, okay? Maybe I'll call on people that I know like Harrison or, or Jessica, you know, people who have been in my, or Ahmed, 
people who, who, who've been in my other classes because I, I simply remember them. It's easy for me to pull them down, okay? So I apologize for that. Well, anyways, uh, this is the question for you, still admitting people. What did we talk about last time? That's the question. What was like the overreaching topic? You don't have to tell me details. Yeah, we talked about uh, decision-making biases. One second, please. Everybody's admitted. Yeah, we talked about biases. Basically what we said, we said that humans have bounded rationality. Bounded rationality may be a trivial idea, but Herbert Simon, an American economist, he received a Nobel Prize for working in this area. Bounded rationality means that humans are not completely rational when it comes to making decisions for a variety of reasons. Sometimes uh, they're driven biases, sometimes they're driven by ideology, sometimes they're driven by emotions, but they do not make decisions that are completely rational, right? And we tried to answer why. We gave some examples uh, of biases in decision-making, why people may not act rationally. And by the way, that list was not exhaustive, right? That list was no exhaustive. There are many other biases and weaknesses that people have uh, when it comes to making decisions. Um, so uh, so th those are more like examples of why things may, may go wrong in a particular scenario. Today, we'll talk more about the decision-making process itself, right? What are the steps in making decisions? And also how computers can support us in, in, in theory, how they can support us in theory in making those decisions. Again, why decision-making is important. So again, humans are not good at making decisions. However, our entire life, some people would argue, is all about making decisions, okay? Now, this statement is not 100% true. I mean, overall, when it comes to life, when it comes to people and society, no statement is 100% true, right? Because some of the things that happen in our lives, they're not due to our decisions, right? For example, uh, everybody, everyone, every single person here got that single most important lottery ticket uh, by being born in a particular family, in a particular town, in a particular state, in a particular country at a particular time, right? In a, uh, with, with a certain set of genetics. So those things have a huge impact on us, on our lives, on our ability to deal with things, on our success, on our failures, and things like that. Now, of course, it's not the single most important factor, right? It's not the, the only factor that is important uh, when it comes to shaping our abilities and our personalities, right? I would say, I actually, I'm not a doctor, but I take interest in that. I would say that, you know, on average, people are saying that genetics, meaning like your, your factors that are beyond your control, they probably explain 50% of who you are, right? On average, okay? The other 50% comes from your own effort, right? From your own desire to achieve something, from your own desire to change things, uh, from your hard work, from your perseverance, and sometimes from luck as well, okay? Now, how do people determine that? Well, uh, there's a fascinating, I mean, it's interesting how ingenious some researchers are. You know, uh, there have been some studies where they would study identical twins who were adopted at birth, right? So genetically, they're more or less identical. However, they grow up in different settings, in different families, because they were adopted at birth, right? And they realized, you know, they realized that those identical twins, they actually differ, you know, depending on where they grow up, right? So for example, when, if they grow up in a family where higher education is valued, where everybody has a university degree, then most of them will end up having a university degree, right? And the opposite is true. So the other 50% is not explained by genetics. So what I'm trying to say, decisions are important, but not 100% important. It's not that everything is explained by our decisions. The same thing, I gave you an example at the individual level, but the same thing happens in an organization. If you work in an organization and it doesn't matter which role you take in that organization, a technical role, let's say you're working as a security analyst or a software developer or a very senior leadership role, your job will largely consist of making decisions based on the data or information that you get, okay? For example, if you're working at that operational level, right, you're dealing with technical decisions. For example, I don't know which programming language to use to develop a particular tool. So that's like a technical decision. If you're working more at the management level, somewhere in the middle of that hierarchy, you're dealing with decisions that are less technical. They're more on human side. For example, what kind of people do we need to hire for this project, right? With what qualities, what experiences, uh, what technical skills, right? 
how do we motivate people? What kind of incentives do we introduce for the team members so that we finish this project on time and within budget, right? So more, more at the management level. And if you're at the very top level right here, if you're a senior leader, like a chief executive officer or, or chief data scientist or chief security officer, you're dealing with, a, with very high level strategic decisions. For example, uh, what our organization should be like five or 10 years from now? How should we redefine ourselves to make sure that we're successful, that we're still in the market? Um, what kind of products do we need to introduce over the next five years to be successful you know, from a financial standpoint for the next 10 years, something like that, right? Very open-ended, very high level uh, decisions, okay? Um, I don't want to start a debate on the topic, but you know, I've noticed that a lot of people who are very smart, you know, technically gifted, they kind of look down on those uh, um, um, managerial decisions. They think, well, you know, this is not for smart people, and they think that if you if you're good at, at uh, I don't know so solving mathematical equations or writing code, you know, that's what defines intelligence. But there's one simple fact. I mean, people who are in those positions, they they get paid. Uh, 10 times, five times, sometimes 100 times more than somebody who's a technical specialist, right? And that kind of tells us that those are the kind of decision making that is most valued, that uh, ambiguous high level strategic decision making, right? That deals with very high level organizational issues, okay? And those decisions are not very technical. They're driven by emotions, by gut feeling, they're driven by political insight, like where, you know, where things are going at the organizational or country level and things like that, right? So, so those are probably the hardest decisions to make. That's why executives, senior managers, senior leaders get paid so much, okay? And those decisions are usually made uh, using some kind of decision-making rule. And also those decision-making rules or procedures are applied to data or information, okay? And by the way, a lot of flaws in decision-making, they also arguably come from two areas. People either have uh, flawed or insufficient data. So we're talking about this information side or the kind of procedure, the rule for making decisions that they're making is flawed, okay? So weaknesses also come from those two areas, either decision-making process or data that is used in the decision-making process. Now, usually no matter what kind of decision you're about to make, uh, most, uh, most decisions, if not all decisions, they will fall into one of those three categories, structured, unstructured, and semi-structured. So all decisions, regardless whether you're making a technical decision or, or high level strategic decision, they will fall into those three categories. And we'll talk about each of those categories in a bit more detail. Stru so let's talk about the first category, structured decisions. They're often called program decisions or programmable decisions. I like that, I like that uh, alternative name and alternative explanation. If you can, you know, if you can imagine writing code, but I'm talking about software code, or maybe entering some kind of formula in Excel that will help you to make the decision, right? Then most likely this is a highly structured decision. Okay. To make it very simple, structured decision, they can be they can be uh, fitted into some kind of formula or, or algorithm, right? Again, computer code, it can be solved with a computer code, right? Um, something, something along, along the lines, let's say you're developing uh, an app, a stock trading application and the decision rule that you're using is very simple. Let's say if price of stock is decreasing, then sell it. If pri price of stock is increasing, then buy it, something like that, right? So you can imagine that you can write software code that, code that does that, right? Something like a series of if then statements. If price less than this, then buy, something like that, right? I would imagine So mm -hmm. the no, they're usually highly unstructured, right? Now, of course, there are some managers they, that, you know, that actually like to make structured decisions, but uh, the name for that is micromanagement, I think. You know, I think it's a crime for an executive to deal with those structured decisions that can be easily done by operations people or even software. Okay? They, they need to spend their time thinking about high-level decisions, right? Uh, the kind of decisions that define the organization, determine its future, things like that. Uh, but nevertheless, those are programmable decisions. Now, what would be like an example of a programmable decision uh, in a different context? Maybe something related to your field or your experience. Like, for example, if you're talking about computer science, what would be an example of a structured decision that a programmer makes?
Well, maybe it's a bad example, but something that came to my mind, like sometimes when people, uh, I forgot the, the exact name for that, but they do uh, software optimization. So they, they, they try to determine like which function works better. So they basically time the execution of each function, right? So decision-making scenario here is simple. If this function is faster than use this function, right? So it's a very programmable based on formula, based on a clear decision rule, okay? Um, if you're dealing, let's say, with information security, then example of a structured decision-making would be something like that. If there are three unsuccessful login attempts, then block that account, right? And again, you don't need human to do that. You can write software code that does that, that automatically switches off accounts or blocks accounts based on number of login attempts, right? So those are structured decisions. And then you have on the opposite side, on the opposite side of spectrum, you have these so-called unstructured decisions. Those are decision scenarios that involve new or unique problems and the individual has little or no programmatic or routine procedures for addressing the problem or making a decision. So usually here we are talking about highly complex new problems, okay? And you can hardly imagine writing computer code that would help you solve that problem, okay? One example of an unstructured, deci uh, of an unstructured decision uh, that comes to my mind, maybe it's a bad example, but it will be something like how to write a good song, how to write a hit, okay? There's no recipe for that, right? How to write a good book, for example, there's no recipe for that, okay? There are some rules and tendencies, but I think by definition to write a good song, right? You need to write something new. You need to produce something novel to people. You cannot just be successful as a musician by recycling what people did in the past. I mean, even if you are recycling, you need to put an interesting twist on it, right? So it's all about innovation. Innovation is hard. And philosophically speaking, how do you explain how to create new things when those things do not exist, right? How do you explain how to create things that do not exist? It's kind of hard to imagine, right? So those are unstructured decisions. Uh, one example of an unstructured decision that organization, technology organizations make all the time, what kind of products to introduce, okay? Should we introduce, I don't know, iPhone 13 or maybe some new device, some kind of wearable device that overshadows smartphones? I mean, what, what, what should we be doing for the next five years product-wise, okay? Uh, Steve Jobs, he's very famous for doing those exercises with his executives. He would ask people like, okay, so what should we do next year? What should we focus on? And they would give him all kinds of ideas and he would write it down on the board and then he would prioritize those ideas. He would ask people to vote to rank those ideas, product ideas from like one to five or something like that, right? And then he would create a list of top 10 and then he would cross out nine and he would leave the, the top item and say, okay, that's what we're gonna focus next year on this particular product, okay? Uh, I don't wanna tell you the whole story of Steve Jobs, but you probably know that at some point, you know, he started this company, Apple Computers, right? That was eventually renamed to simply Apple Incorporated. And then I think by the time he was 30, he got fired from that company. So shareholders were not happy with him. So he got fired and once he got fired, he went to work for Next, which was a computer company producing uh, engineering workstations. Then he also worked for Pixar. You know, he produced those cartoons like Toy Story, maybe something else. And then after the success, you know, then what happened, Apple bought Next and then, uh, you know, something was not going well in Apple. They were losing market share. And then he was kind of rehired to be the CEO again or chairman of the board, I forgot, right? So when he came back, the first thing he did, he discontinued a lot of products that were not profitable for the company. And that involves, maybe you, you remember the name. Remember they had some kind of Palm computer? I forgot the name for that. Something like Palm, Apple Palm, or I forgot. But basically it was like that first PDA, personal digital assistant, kind of handheld computer, okay? It didn't take off for them. So he discontinued a lot of things and he focused on that iPod, you know, all those new products that kind of reinvented eventually a company, right? So those are very high level, uh, high, le high level problems or decisions to make what kind of products we need to uh, uh, focus on, right? Any other examples of highly unstructured decision-making where decision scenarios where you can hardly imagine a software code being written to, to help you with that? something related to business or technology. Yeah, making games, right? How do you make a game that everybody likes? You know, kind of, um, again, by definition, I mean, I'm not very knowledgeable in video games and I'm proud of that. I, I try to stay away from video games because it saves me a lot of time. Uh, if you know me, I only play Counter-Strike. Uh, but I haven't installed it yet for, for the last uh, several months. So I haven't even played Counter-Strike for like since uh, summer or something like that. But anyways, 
yeah, how do you make a video game that everybody buys, everybody likes? I think by definition, you need to be innovative. You need to introduce something new. Uh, one company that stands out in uh, video gaming, at least for me, is id Software or ID Software, the Dallas-based company behind uh, Wolfenstein, Quake, what else? Yeah, Do uh, Doom is probably their flagship product. Now, they were innovators, right? The reason they were so successful, actually, two, in my opinion, two things. Number one, they used that scrolling technology to create a first-person shooter. It wasn't like a true 3D environment. It was like basically you scrolling through certain views you know, as you play the game. So that was the technical innovation. Now, what was the marketing innovation that, that allowed them to quickly capture market share? Do you remember? I kind of remember it because I played Wolfenstein. Um, um, basically, they had this shareware model that was very uh, uh, new at that time. So basically, the way it worked, I think they distributed Wolfenstein. Or, what was the name of that game? Wolfenstein or Wolf? Wolfenstein. I think what they did, they distributed like uh, the first three levels, something like for free. So you play those three levels. If you like it, you can buy the remaining seven levels, something like that, right? That worked like magic. People would just uh, play this game, fall in love with it, and then call them to purchase the remaining, uh, uh, to download uh, subscription or license to the remaining uh, levels of, of Wolfenstein, right? So that was their business innovation, how to get this game around and collect a lot of uh, fees from people. So yeah, those are unstructured decisions. And then you have semi-structured, somewhere in between. It's hard to, it's hard to determine whether those are structured or, some, or, or unstructured decisions, somewhere in between, which means that some aspects of that decision-making can be structured, but some aspects cannot, okay? Um, when it comes to semi-structured uh, decision-making, an example that came, comes to my mind is some sort of financial analysis, the kind of analysis the stock market analysts do for example, they look at, uh, at companies' financial ba balance sheets, they look at their stock performance, and those things, they can be structured, right? They can tell you uh, finan financial status is good or bad. So you can write code that evaluates financial status, right? But what you really do about that, like about that financial status, whether you put more money or less money, you buy or sell stock, is really unstructured. Sometimes it's just a matter of intuition, right? So people do different things, although they have the, exactly the same financial information about companies, right? So to me, it's like a semi-structured decision. Some aspects of your decision-making is structured because you're looking at those highly structured formula-based financial statements, right? But what you do on the top of it is unstructured. And also even, even those financial statements, they're not completely structured because uh, some of those numbers, they are, they are based on formulas. However, how those formulas exactly are used are subject to your own interpretation. Okay. Uh, as an accountant, you have to make certain interpretation about transactions, right? You need to, to decide, okay, this is transaction of this type or that type. And based on that, you calculate those values, right? And some accountants, unfortunately, they're very creative when it comes to making interpretations. They make very stretched out arguments about how to, to treat certain expenses. And if they become too creative, they go to jail for it because, you know, eventually people say, well, there's no way it's, it's, a, it's a false interpretation. I mean, this is fraud. I mean, you're, you're fooling us, right? by saying that this is not our expense and it has to be somewhere else, something like that. So our accountants sometimes cook books by stretching their arguments very, very far from reality, right? And it's not like outward lie, but it's just like, um, um, how should I put it? What is that? Yeah, it's like being stretching, making like too, too far, uh, like a very logically flawed argument to the point where you suspect that that flaw, that flaw in the argument is on purpose, okay? Just to give you an example, what uh, accountants at Enron did, uh, they, they put their expenses off books. You know, I, again, I'm not that knowledgeable in finance, but what they did, they basically opened a number of offshore companies that were actually controlled by Enron CFO, Andy Pasto, right? And what they would do, they would run their projects through those, uh, uh, per, uh, through those uh, subsidiaries, right? So for example, instead of saying that Enron invested money into an energy plant in India, they would say, okay, this subsidiary invested, right? And when it comes to reporting accounting numbers, they would only report positive numbers on Enron side and all the losses will be reported on that subsidiary side, right? So they'll say, oh, those are not our losses, they're their losses, this is not our company, right? But then of course, when it came to court, they proved that those companies were, were, were technically controlled by Andy Festo and therefore, you know, it's not something separate from Enron, right? To the point where Andy Festo was the CFO of Enron, and then he was also the owner of that company, parent company. So how can you say that those are independent entities, right? And of course, Andy Festo, he put some of that money into his pocket because he was that legal owner of those other companies that faced the losses. So he would charge some fees 
that go to his pocket. So Enron loses money, but Andy Fast was actually making money from all those transactions happening, right? So, so yeah, sometimes uh, accounting decisions are also kind of semi-structured and some people make them so unstructured to, to hide the, the actual financial performance of the company. Now, I have a question for you. Let's go back to that list. Um, if we talk about humans versus computers, in what type of decision-making do you think computers are the best? What would you say? Okay, structured. And what about humans? In what kind of decision-making they can beat computers? Unstructured. Well, you know, I, I kind of agree with you partially. If this question was asked, me, was asked like 10 years ago, I would say 100%. Computers are very good at uh, structured decision-making, right? Because we can write code, we can uh, implement some kind of formula using code and, and computers do not make mistakes unlike humans. So, so I would agree with you 100% maybe 10 years ago. But nowadays things are becoming different with the advancements in artificial intelligence, machine learning and things like that, okay? Um, you know, uh, artificial intelligence was a very hot topic in 1970s. In 1960s, this is where, when computing became very popular, like a corporate computing, individual computing. Uh, it didn't hit the mainstream until probably 80s or 90s when personal computers were introduced. But in 1960s, it's like the, the birth of computing, right? Where everybody started using it, at least at the corporate level. So in 1970s, the topic of artificial intelligence became a very big research area, okay? And then after 1970s, it kind of died. You know, people kind of left that topic alone. I think the main reason based on me actually looking at some of the books from that era was that researchers became dissatisfied with artificial intelligence. I remember specifically reading one book and they kind of said that, look, after 10 years of research, uh, the only thing that artificial intelligence could do is to play chess, but even then they would lose to a real grandmaster, somebody who's an experienced chess player, right? So what do you like, why do we need to invest more time and, and uh, resources into artificial intelligence resource when computers cannot beat humans in chess? Okay, now things started to change, I think approximately late 1990s. Up to late 1990s, there were all those uh, chess matches where a computer would play against a grandmaster and inevitably, inevitably computer would get beaten by a human, right? Uh, things have changed, I forgot the date, but it was like late 90s, maybe early 2000. There was this uh, series of matches between uh, Gary Kasparov, that famous Russian chess grandmaster and IBM's Deep Blue, right? And I think there were like several, like over the years, there were like several matches. I think he won like the first one or two matches. Uh, Gary Casper won, and then he got bitten. The last time I followed that subject matter, he got bitten the last time he played against Deep Blue, okay? Now, uh, Gary Casper still maintains that he never lost that match because he, thought, he found out after the game that he was pl playing not just against computer, he was playing against the com computer and a team of people, okay? And as it turns out, it was true because uh, this team of creators of, of that uh, chess program that was based on Deep Blue supercomputer created by IBM, during breaks between games, they were adjusting their algorithms. They were doing something to those algorithms. Right? So it wasn't like perfectly computer against human, right? But anyways, nowadays, I think after that, I stopped following because I kind of lost interest. I always found it fascinating that humans beat supercomputers at, at the game of chess. I think after that, it doesn't matter what Gary Kasparov says, computers start to beat humans in the game of chess, right? So now a game of chess, it's still a highly structured game, right? It's a highly structured decision-making scene. Now, of course, the number of combinations, there's exact number for, for that. The number of combinations and outcomes in, in chess game, it's, it's a finite number, but it's really close to infinity. I mean, it's just a very, very vast, huge number uh, when it comes to the number of combinations that are possible in a game of chess, right? But nevertheless, computers now beat humans in something that is between structured and, and, uh, un, and, and uh, unstructured. I'll put the game of chess there, right? Now, uh, but again, you, you, maybe you can argue that chess, a game of chess is highly structured, right? So maybe it's still like computers beating humans at a structured scenario. Now, let me give you an example of something that does seem to be highly unstructured, in my opinion. It's driving. And I, and I actually remember reading about it in artificial intelligence books. They were saying, look, no matter how powerful a computer is, a computer cannot drive a car through a busy city, right? And humans, on the other hand, no matter how dumb they are, they can still get a driver's license and drive anywhere they want, right? So they can have very low IQ, but they can drive better than a computer. Because you understand that when you're driving a car, you're dealing with a lot of unstructured decision-making, right? It's not just about, um, uh, oh, I guess what I'm saying, anything can happen on the road, 
right? You can have all kinds of crazy scenarios, something that you cannot even imagine to the point where, I don't know, a passenger jet lands on the freeway and you need to deal with this issue, right? It happens by the way, right? Some, pass some, some, some airplanes actually try to land on a freeway when there's something wrong with the engine and things like that, right? So, so would you agree with me that driving is, is, more, is much closer to unstructured rather than structured, right? But now, as you probably know, computers are actually becoming increasingly better at driving, right? Uh, one of those examples that I've been following is that Google car project that eventually uh, got uh, renamed into Lamo. I think that's the name of the company. They got, it got separated from Google. Are, are you aware of that project? So they're creating those uh, uh, artificial drivers that operate vehicles. And uh, let me just show you something about this project. And by the way, the last time I've checked, those vehicles, they have a much better driving record when it comes to safety compared to humans, okay? Um, one interesting thing about their test, those tests, uh, I think they moved somewhere in recent years. I forgot where they moved, somewhere in, in Nevada or something like that. But in the early days, they were doing all of their tests in San Francisco Bay Area. And San Francisco Bay Area is a very challenging environment to drive because number one, it's overpopulated. So there's a lot of traffic. And number two, they really have crazy landscape, all those hills, mountains, valleys. So it's hard to, to orient yourself in that kind of situation. Um, those statistics are changing, but, but, but the last time I've checked, they, they basically said some, the last time I checked their data, they said that after driving 96,000 miles through San Francisco Bay Area, those computer operated cars only had four accidents. And out of those four accidents, three accidents happened when a human was operating it. So somebody was pulling out, pulling out from a parking lot. So there was only one accident involving a computer making some kind of mistake and making an accident, okay? But I think in, in recent years, there have been like one deadly accident involving one of those cars, right? Where a pedestrian actually unfortunately died. Uh, again, I don't want to trivialize it, but again, if, if we compare it with people who died due to human drivers, I think it's not you know, that big of a deal. Although a death of a person is always a big deal, at least for someone. It's like a very short video clip. Hey guys in Zoom, can you hear this video or not? No, sir. A little bit, but not very well. Okay, well, maybe you can just launch that video on your own. Just keep it mute so that people cannot hear, hear your uh, video, okay? Okay. Because to be honest, I don't know like what's the best way of uh, broadcasting sound from Zoom. I think you should be able to hear it, but not really well. Vehicles and the laptop shows them as large as boxes on the screen. 
As our vehicle passes by a large truck, it will actually keep it a farther side of the lane and give ourselves a little bit more space. We've also taught the vehicle to recognize and navigate through a construction zone. The vehicle sensors can stop at one signs and turns early to alert the car of any main blockage ahead, and then we can change lanes safely. Another thing that's really important is for the vehicle to drive in a naturalistic way. Because when it's natural and the car abides by social norms on the road, it's also safer. For example, at four-way stops, people typically rely on eye contact to communicate and turn it is. And in our case, the vehicle inches forward into the intersection to indicate its intent. So my role as a safety driver is first and foremost to keep the car, myself, and everyone around me safe. And in addition to keeping the car safe, I also provide detailed feedback to developers and let them know the car does anything that maybe I wouldn't have done personally. Maybe the car wasn't assertive enough in a lane change or wasn't fast enough at a green light. We provide the detailed feedback so they can find you in the whole driving experience. By getting out there and driving in the real world, we're getting a better understanding of what exactly it's going to take to improve the safety, comfort, and ease of transportation. And that's really what our project is all about. So as you can see, computers are even now increasingly becoming better and safer drivers than humans, right? And by the way, what's uh, inhibiting the growth of those uh, self-driving cars in many states is legislature, it's not the technology. Like for example, some states do not have proper legislature to accommodate a car going around without, it, without the driver, right? Because a lot of legal, legal questions arise. For example, if this car becomes, uh, gets into an accident, whose fault it is, right? The owner of the car, uh, the person who made that software that, that operates the car, right? So there are all kinds of things that need to be uh, discussed. But what, uh, what, what it tells me is that now there's evidence that computers are becoming better than humans at unstructured decision making, right? Any thoughts on that? Does it scare you? Does, does it seem to be a good thing? Go ahead. Is that unstructured though? Because it's going off of preset systems that it is learned over driving. It, 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 it's going off of the system that the software is. Okay. Yeah, I see your point. I wouldn't say it's like 100% chaotic and structured where there are no rules, right? There are some rules, but I believe it's it's closer to unstructured rather than to structured, right? Because there is no like uh, specific times when those drivers appear. There's no like specific way that, I don't know, a bike, uh, uh, cyclist drive on the road, right? So those things are, are subject to serendipity and chance, right? So that's why I'm saying it's not 100% unstructured, but it's closer to unstructured rather than structured, right? Any other thoughts? Well, I'm not developing those algorithms, but I, I think from the order, maybe because green is always like on the left side, or you see what I'm saying? It's like the way it's located, maybe it can determine it from that. Um, yeah, so th those are interesting nuances, right? To the point where you're wondering, like, uh, do I want to commit my safety to, this, this, to those decision-making rules or not, right? Um, now, let me show you something that is maybe even more persuasive. Writing songs. I mean, I told you that writing songs is a very open-ended, unstructured decision-making scenario. Do you know that nowadays uh, uh, there are some researchers working in that area of uh, machine learning-based creativity, and they're developing algorithms where computers can do creative things, such as writing songs or poems, or, or uh, holding uh, uh, open-ended conversations with people. So let me show you a song that was actually, or play a song that was actually written by a computer. Do, do you, have you heard about Eurovision contest? Do you know what it is? Well, to me, it's like uh, it's like a contest uh, in singing among European countries. To me, I never watch it. To me, it's like a, to be honest, it's like a dumb thing to to watch. I don't understand this whole idea of competing in songwriting. I mean, this is not running. I mean, this is not lifting. How can you compete? Oh, this is the best song. This is you know, this is the worst song. And the other thing I hate about Eurovision, it's all like it's always driven by politics. So basically, people from European countries they vote for those singers. And it's always about like political likes and dislikes. It's never about, you know, really it's about performers, right? So for example, um, uh, well, actually I don't want to give it because maybe it will be too controversial, but you know, there are some countries that don't like each other for whatever reason. So they would vote against those uh, singers coming from those countries and things like that. Um, 
So, uh, so it, it's a dumb contest to me, like this, this whole idea that somebody can be number one. And the, the third argument that I had, nothing good came out of those contexts except ABBA, you know, that, that Swedish, is a Swedish band, ABBA. So they were like Eurovision winners, like back in uh, what, 70s or something like that. So that's the only thing that came up of this contest, right? So I don't, I don't remember like people say, oh, I'm so proud like, of, of our singing. I mean, what does it have to do with you? Like why you're proud of what, right? So, but anyways, this is like this Europop uh, platform. So they combine all the songs from Eurovision and then they use neural networks to teach a computer how to combine and recombine tunes to create new lyrics and new uh, musical combinations. So this is what, what came up with. So what do you think? Is it a good song? You like it? What What are your thoughts? So <laughs> it makes me smile because it's like you know it's like wow AI hey, can you know actually create music and lyrics, but it it doesn't create any association with the lyrics. Well, uh, isn't that normal nowadays? I mean, listen to Billie Eilish songs. I mean, it's just like a bunch of nonsense. Yeah. Find some, who is famous like, for having very nonsensical song? Bjork, you know, you know that singer? It's just like the whole thing doesn't make any sense. So, so that's actually the fashion nowadays to make things nonsense, to make lyrics nonsensical, right? I don't know, uh, but I will say like, it, it recognizes that there's some sort of a pattern because there's no word association, but it has a chorus. So it keeps it kept saying, oh, baby, bye, 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 oh, bye, bye, yeah. bye, repeatedly. So it recognizes that there's some repetition. Yeah, it uses some rough rules there's of composition. No association. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, anyways, and it's not, by the way, they disclose it. it's not completely computer written. Basically, computer produced like all those parts and possibilities, and then humans combined, like they edited those parts, right? So it's not a computer, 100% computer generated. Just like the Deep Blue game against Casper, it wasn't completely computer playing against him, right? Well, anyways, all this brings us to this question, and I will leave you because we'll, we'll revisit that question uh, towards the, the, the end of the semester. If computers are becoming better than humans in creative tasks, then the question becomes what's left for us, right? Does Earth, does this universe actually need us? I mean, what, what is our place in this world if computers can drive cars, write songs, uh, crack jokes, right? Entertain other people through video games, like what's left for us, right? What is the, I mean, uh, we're talking about pragmatic need, right? Like for example, if you're, if you're starting to work as a taxi driver, right, then I uh, wish you best of luck because in, in my opinion, those dri uh, driverless cars will overtake within the next five years. That's my prediction, right? So, so it will impact our employment, but it will also, uh, it will also raise like a broader question. Like what, what is the niche in this world that humans should have, right? Now, so just think about it. I'm, I'm still researching that subject. I, I discussed it in a couple of classes that I've taught, but I'm still thinking about it. How computer, how humans are better than computers? In what ways, right? Is it our emotions? Is it our sense of ethics? Are computers more ethical, more objective than us? Are computers better than us? Because computers may not have positive emotions that we have, such as compassion, love, but they also don't have negative emotions, such as hatred, right? So this is what I'm thinking about, like what will be left for us if that scenario happens when computers become clearly better than, than us in unstructured decision-making. And by the way, the name for that is singularity point. All right, so we'll, we'll talk about singularity towards the end of the semester. Uh, by the way, when we are talking about decision-making, when, when we say somebody makes decision, it's not necessarily an individual. Decisions can also be made by teams or groups and also at the organizational level. Sometimes an organization as a whole converges on a particular strategy. 
And uh, obviously, all those types of decision makers, either at the, at the individual level or organization level, they differ, in, they differ in their background, in their educational level, in their experiences. And therefore, they approach decision making from different angles. But nevertheless, there are some patterns, there are some rules, overreaching rules or, or decision making patterns that you see over and over again across all kinds of individuals, all kinds of groups, and all kinds of organizations. Uh, at the very minimum, a decision should follow the so-called uh, classic decision-making process. By the way, this classic decision-making process was another area of work by Herbert Simon, that famous American um, Nobel Prize winning economist who came up with this idea of bounded rationality. So he basically said that, well, humans are bounded in their rationality, so how can they overcome those bounds? So that was one of his suggestions, by using a structured decision-making process. And there are many formulations of that process. There are some you know, slight differences in steps, but, but usually it's something along those lines. In order for you to be good at making decisions, you need to go through the following five steps or phases. Number one, intelligence. Intelligence means you do background research. You don't make decisions unless you know quite a bit about the problem, right? So you don't make decisions without any information, without any prior research. Okay, so that's the first step, intelligence. Intelligence means research, doing research about the problem that you're dealing with. Stage number two, step number two, design. Once you understand a problem, right? You design alternative solutions, right? You know, it's you, you come up with different ways of addressing a particular problem, okay? So, so keep, keep your mind open to different, uh, to different possibilities. Don't just jump to a solution right away once you understand the problem. Think about different ways of solving it. By the way, Sometimes doing nothing is also a possibility, right? For example, uh, Warren Buffett says that doing nothing is one of the hardest uh, uh, things for him. He always feels that whenever he has uh, free cash lying around that he can invest, he always starts thinking about investing into a company, right? But sometimes it's better not to invest into a company when you don't have deal, good deals on the market. Sometimes it's better to wait until a good deal comes up, right? But Warren Buffett says that he always tends to spend money once he has it, okay? And his partner, Charlie Mungers, he's good at stopping him at that. He said, look, just because we have money, and usually they have money from Geico, which is that insurance company that Berkshire Hathaway owns. And as you can imagine, insurance companies generate a lot of cash because those are like those monthly payments that people make for house insurance and, and car insurance. So whenever they get that money, they, they feel pressed to invest. So design means think about different, different ways of addressing the problem. Choice means start evaluating those different solutions, right? Evaluate those solutions one by one in comparison to each other to determine which one is the best. Decision actually means selecting a particular course of action based on your evaluation. And implementation means you go ahead and implement the decision, okay? Now, what one step that people usually add to this classic decision-making process is the so-called feedback loop, right? You implement it and then you, you see what happened. If your decision, if your implementation solved the problem, then you're good. If not, then you go back to intelligence and you go through the cycle again. So sometimes feedback loop, loop is added. Um, what, me, what most people do, they skip some of those steps, especially the first few steps, and usually they, they jump to solutions immediately, right? You've heard the saying probably that to a person with a hammer, everything looks like what? like a nail, right? To a person with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So they, they have a, the tool, they have a tool like a hammer and they are looking for ways to apply that tool, okay? Uh, that reminds me, uh, a friend of mine, he's a senior Java developer. And whenever I ask him a question, he, his response is always Java. Like whatever I ask him, like what's the best way to do this or develop this web tool, he always says Java. Java is always the best tool, right? Because he's biased, he's biased towards the tool. That's what he's using in his daily life and that's what he knows, right? So people, they don't evaluate uh, uh, different possibilities. They don't do any background research. They just jump to the solution. What I see students doing all the time, like graduate students, when they work on their projects, when they do, uh, when they consider different solutions, they don't consider like the most obvious solutions, such as buying something that is off the shelf, something that is, exists, right? Instead, they always like insist on developing something unique, which may not be an optimal solution, right? Sometimes it's better to use something that is already out there Otherwise, you may end up reinventing the wheel, right? Doing the same thing that, that uh, people did in the past, successfully or unsuccessfully. So 
So this is the classic decision-making process that Herbert Simon uh, kind of proposed, and that made it to a lot of textbooks. Uh, you know, and it's been extended with a number of steps, such as feedback loop, like some extra steps and things like that. Now, when it comes to strategies, now strategy is not the same as as the uh, the decision-making. Strategy means like the overall orientation, the overall uh, uh, approach to decision-making. There are the following. Uh, this is just one classification. Uh, but there are the following strategies that people use for decision making optimizing satisfying elimination by aspect incrementalism mixed scanning and analytical hierarchy process some of those topics are actually vast topics like analytical hierarchy process or ahp it's like a big field on its own there are books written about it right but we'll go briefly through through each of those uh, decision making strategies i'll give you some examples maybe you will give me some examples from your own experience or your own life uh, Optimization, by the way, this is something that we will do in this class. We'll work on several optimization problems uh, when we, uh, when we uh, work on our assignments. Uh, look, this is my way of explaining optimization. Optimization means minimizing or maximizing a particular variable, right? If you're talking about a business scenario, typically organizations try to maximize what variable? So which uh, important variable all organizations, all businesses try to maximize to make sure it's as big as possible? What would this Profit, right? So they all try to maximize profit. Uh, of course, nowadays, there's a lot of talk about corporate social responsibility and things like that. But uh, I don't believe in corporate social, in social responsibility being above profit simply because of the following logical uh, argument. A company cannot exist without a profit, right? You know, it's, it needs to be profitable to contribute to charity, to contribute to social development, right? So how can you put social development first when a company can live without social development, but they cannot live without, without profit, right? So organizations try to maximize profit, even nonprofit organizations, right? You would imagine a universe like Murray State would not care about money because they're not for-profit organization, but they do, right? They really want to collect tuition. They really like it, right? The more money comes in, the more buildings they can build, the more faculty, uh, they can hire and things like that, right? So even non-profit organizations are actually focused on profit despite what they're saying, right? And then sometimes organizations want to minimize certain variables. Again, I think that would be cost variable. They, all organizations want to uh, maximize uh, revenues and minimize cost because that, ma that maximizes their profits, okay? So that's optimization. Uh, any other examples of optimization scenarios in business? Like a lot of transportation companies, they want to like optimize either based on delivery time, like they want to deliver packages or, or cargo as soon as possible. Sometimes they want to minimize fuel consumption. It depends, right? So they have different optimization variables. Okay. Any other examples of optimization uh, approach being used in decision making? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, some organizations like that, they like basically say, we don't care how much those people cost, we want the best, right? So they're optimizing like, I guess, talent or, or uh, qualifications of their employees, right? So, so they're focused on that. Some organizations are actually not about the qualification, they're, they're minimizing the labor cost, right? So they will hire the cheapest labor possible. It happens in construction, sometimes they'll find the cheapest people possible to do the job because I guess they believe that, uh, you know, that job doesn't require that much skill or preparation, right? So that's optimization. So thank you for those examples. Now, another decision-making strategy that is kind of similar to optimization is called satisficing, right? Satisficing is also like that. It's also similar to optimization in, in a sense that you're interested in a particular variable, you're interested in, in maximizing or minimizing it, but you're not completely ignoring other variables because they cannot be completely ignored, okay? So you're doing like barely enough in all areas to make sure you keep yourself afloat, but you're really focusing on one area, okay? Uh, that reminds me of one of my, uh, I wouldn't say college friends, but one of the guys that I knew in college, he was an interesting person because I took a couple of classes with him and he would always barely pass a class. He would always like barely get a D. He was known for that, right? In all classes, he would barely pass, right? So everybody thought that maybe he's not very smart or maybe he is not very serious about studies, but then he wrote, he won an international programming contest. So he was like kind of ranked as one of the best programmers in the world among college students, right? And then people discovered that that's what his passion was. He spent most of the time writing code 
and he did bare minimum in all of the classes so that he passes those classes without spending too much time in those classes, right? Eventually what happened, so that was his satisfying strategy. He could not ignore classes, he could not fail classes, but he would do like bare minimum to pass courses like at the D level while focusing 100% on programming classes, right? Well, eventually he got kicked out from the university because he failed, so you know, he, the satisfying algorithm did not work. He failed so many courses, he couldn't catch up. And the rule was that if you fail like several courses back to back, you get kicked out, you get dismissed, right? And then you have a chance of restarting like from previous years. So to be honest, I don't know what happened to him afterwards. I knew that he got kicked out, but I don't know what he did next, right? So satisfying, right? Making sure everything is kind of okay while focusing on one area. Um, I also have this theory in life. Uh, actually, it's not my theory. I, I thought it was mine, but I think somebody else came up with it and I read about it, but then I kind of appropriated it as my own. Uh, my, my own theory of happiness, I believe that in order to be happy in life, you need to focus on three pillars. Number one, uh, I call it, uh, well, well, number one is uh, health. You cannot be happy unless you're in a good health, physical health, uh, uh, psychological health. Number two, I call it like money. So you need to have enough resources to sustain yourself, to have to eat, you know, to have shelter and things like that, to be professionally successful. And three, I put relationships and relationships in a broad sense, like relationships with your loved ones, with your friends, with God's, you know, spiritual relationships. So in my opinion, you cannot ignore any of those pillars. You need to be doing work in all of those pillars, right? Now you can do some satisfying, which means that you can focus on your career, right? You can focus on your health, but you cannot ignore everything else. You need to, you need to be working there. Now, people who focus completely, in other words, they don't do satisfying, they completely focus on one area, usually they end up miserably, right? For example, we all envy, uh, you know, I don't know, randomly, people like Madonna because they're so rich and famous, but most of us, we don't want her life, right? Because she has been so focused on her career, maybe she let go of a lot of other things such as her health, right? Her relationships and things like that, right? For example, people envy Tiger Woods uh, because of his amazing achievements in golf, but Tiger Woods, he started playing golf since he was four and he's been doing it his entire life, right? And you know that he had some problems in his personal lives, right? With his wife and things like that. That's not because he's like an evil person, but because he's so focused on that goal thing, right? He overlooks everything else, right? So satisfying means a strategy where you're trying to do barely enough in all those areas while focusing on one important area. Elimination by aspect. Another decision-making scenario is you focus on the things that you don't need and you eliminate possibilities, you focus on things that you need or don't need and you eliminate possibilities that don't match that profile. For example, let's say you're trying to buy a car, right? So you come up with the following criteria. You'll say that I want a sedan uh, that is under three years old and made in Japan, right? So those three criteria will eliminate a lot of possibilities, right? So for example, if you're buying a car in, in Murray, it will completely eliminate, I don't know, 70% of all cars for sale, and you will co focus on a much smaller group when it comes to making your decision, right? Um, they, do, uh, they do it in, in real estate shows all the time, right? They ask people, so what are you looking for? They would say three bedrooms, three bathrooms, you know, uh, below half a million, something like that. And that they will go from there. They would only show the properties that, that fit that profile. Incrementalism, another decision-making scenario. Incrementalism means small change from the previous decision. Last year, we spent $1 million on research and development. This year, let's increase it by 5%, right? So that's incrementalism, basing your decision on the previous decision. Uh, mixed scanning, uh, there's an article that I posted about this to Canvas. It's, it's, again, it's a, bad, it's a big subject to, to explain it in five minutes, but mixed scanning means combining macro and micro, okay? This is the type of uh, decision-making that doctors do. For example, when you come to a doctor and you're not feeling well, uh, you see the doctor does not, a doctor typically would not examine your entire body, right? Because your entire body is a very complex biological machine and it would take years to fully examine it, right? So instead doctor will take that big thing, right? And then uh, sc like scan your entire body, like kind of roughly, right? Get a sense of what's happening. And then he or she will limit uh, analysis to one particular area, let's say your heart or something like that. Right? So the doctor will ignore that complexity and, and do a very thorough job within one small area. Right? So that's what mixed scanning means, dealing with general and specific at the same time and dealing with complex and reducing it to a small manageable area. 
And then another, uh, another uh, strategy or approach to decision-making is called analytic uh, hierarchy process or AHP. Uh, it's an interesting approach because it involves quantifying qualitative things. So it's both qualitative and quantitative approach to decision-making. For example, let's say we're trying to hire a CEO or chief executive officer. So what people would do under the AHP procedure, they would ask people like general opinions. So what kind of qualities are you looking for in a CEO? So people would say uh, leadership, innovativeness, compassion, things like that, right? So they would write down those categories and then they would ask people to vote on the importance of those categories. By voting, you will quantify, right? So for example, if 30% of people voted for uh, leadership, then leadership will have 30% weight in your evaluation, right? And then you would have candidates applying for the job of CEO and you would evaluate them, let's say, based on the top 10 factors that people came up with, right? On each factor, let's say leadership, people will vote one to 10. And then that voting, that average vote will be adjusted by weight based on people's priorities, right? So that's called analytical hierarchy process. So you go from those hierarchies of qualitative, quantitative to create like a scoring mechanisms for highly unstructured decision-making scenarios. So that's HP. Now, uh, so this is one classification. Another classification is in terms of uh, uh, the kind of apparatus or the mean that is used for decision-making. And that's just like a, a, another way of classifying uh, uh, decision-making models or decision-making approaches. Some decision-making uh, approaches are deterministic in, in the sense that they're linear, okay? Again, you can think here of a formula where you can plug in all those uh, arguments into a function or values into variable uh, values into a formula and you get your answer, right? So for example, you plug in uh, all of your um, uh, financial indicators as a human and then your tax rate will be calculated based on that. So that's a deterministic or linear decision-making scenario. Stochastic is not very deterministic. It's based on, on probabilities, right? So it's something along the lines like if then. So it's not just a formula, it's a series of possibilities or scenarios and each possibility and scenario has a probability, right? Something, um, um, I guess uh, doctors use this when, when it comes to diagnosing people, right? They know that the uh, probabilities associated with certain diseases, uh, when it comes, uh, you know, especially uh, diseases, um, Probabilities of having a particular disease, given your age, given your gender, right? Things like that. So they would, based on those probabilities, they would, they would try to go a particular route when it comes to treating people. Uh, simulation means uh, generating uh, many alternative scenarios and just evaluating each of those scenarios to see how they impact. So, so simulation is more like a game, like playing different possibilities and based on that, learning something about your problem. Um, uh, one example of a simulation would be something like uh, uh, doing fire drills repetitively, like you simulate fires in this building in different locations and you see how people react, right? And by, by observing their reaction, you, you learn some, certain things about this problem where you will learn that oh, overall people are unprepared when it comes to evacuating. No matter where the fire starts, they all run randomly across the building, something like that, right? So that's simulation, generating different possibilities and, until you learn something about your problem area. And then you have domain specific. It's not really driven by any apparatus, but in different, uh, you know, in different uh, uh, domains, in different industries, they use different approaches to decision making. Some of them are structured, some of them are unstructured, some of them are mathematical, others are not. Uh, that reminds me of, uh, like speaking about domain specific. That reminds me of the field of finance or investments. I would say largely the field of finance, the field of investments, is driven by mathematical modeling, right? So they del they, they develop those sophisticated instruments, usually implemented in the form of software that help them understand financial performance of companies and decide whether to invest into a particular area or not. Okay? But, so that's very common in finance. By the way, not everybody in finance subscribes to that quantitative paradigm. One of those people is Warren Buffett, one of the most su successful investors of all time. According to him, he doesn't believe uh, what, what they call technical analysis. right? He believes that business is largely about those software qualitative factors that can hardly be captured with numbers. So for example, when Warren Buffett talks about his investment philosophy, I think he has like five criteria. I may not remember all five, but he says something like, when I look at the company, the first thing I ask myself, do I like, do I trust the people behind that company? If, if, if it's somebody unethical, somebody incapable running that company, I'm not gonna invest into it. And he's saying like, I'm rich enough to bypass 
those get rich opportunities if, if I don't feel comfortable working with people there, right? So he only invests in, in companies run by people that he likes and respects. Number two, he looks at the overall long-term prospects of that company. So for example, if you are a tobacco company, most likely, and, and I'm, 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 I'm actually glad that, that it's happening, most likely you're not gonna have a bright future because people are increasingly knocking down that habit they stop smoking, they stop using tobacco, right? Which is good. So this means that tobacco companies, most likely they're not gonna have a bright future, okay? So overall, you know, uh, prospect of that industry. Number three, he looks at competitive advantage. Does this company stand out in the industry, right? So for example, some companies as Warren Buffett says have share of people's mind, right? For example, Coca-Cola is one of those companies. It's everywhere, right? It's so deeply engraved in people's minds all over the world. Uh, it's not likely that Coca-Cola will cease to exist rapidly, right? In fact, I'm surprised with, with the growing consciousness, health consciousness, and concern about consuming sugar, people are drinking more and more Coke, surprisingly, right? Also, you would imagine that McDonald's would start declining, but they're prospering. McDonald's is doing great all over the world, right? I guess there's something about McDonald's and Coke that has shared people's minds, and those things are not going away anywhere. And then uh, another criteria that he's using is price. That's the only quantitative criteria. He says the price has to be right. I mean, if it's too expensive, he's not buying at the peak of the market. He's buying actually during crises when prices become low. Most people do the opposite, right? They buy things when the market is booming, thinking it will boom forever, which is not true. And they sell things when everybody starts panicking and they start dumping that stock, right? I forgot what the fifth criteria is, but I think I told you four, right? So Warren Buffett does not use quantitative models. In fact, he claims he doesn't own a computer. He says he only uses a cell phone that he, uh, that the primary use of that cell phone is for watching YouTube videos and reading newspapers online. So in different, in different domains, there are different approaches to decision-making and, and, and you know, they're just two, uh, you know, even within one domain, there are like different uh, models or approaches to decision-making. Now, uh, one, one thing I would like to add here is that we're talk, we talked about conceptual or formal uh, decision-making scenarios, right? A lot of the times in many industries, important uh, scenarios in, in, in a lot of industries, no formal approaches to decision-making is used. And those informal approaches are usually called in decision support uh, literature as garbage can models. Did I spell can correctly? Uh, you, know, you know what I'm talking about, like a garbage can, right? Where people put trash. The reason they call it garbage can model, they basically say that your head is like a garbage, sometimes uh, decision makers treat their head as a garbage can and they throw all kinds of things into that garbage can, such as their technical understanding of the problem, their prior experiences, maybe personal feelings, emotions, gut feelings, right? Their analysis of the political situation based on that they come up with a decision, right? So again, it kind of goes back to this bounded rationality. Humans are not completely rational. Sometimes they treat their head as a garbage can and they make decisions that literally come from that kind of garbage can of data and pieces of information. Um, that reminds me, a lot, of, a lot of important decisions are made like that. I was once reading a book by, by a bodyguard of Boris Yeltsin, who was the first president of Russia, right? And there was this episode where he had a conflict with the parliament, the head of parliament and things like that. And there were like all kinds of conspiracy theories to explain that conflict to the point where some people were saying that the head of the parliament was his legitimate son and you know, things like that. Well, according to the bodyguard, the reason he got upset at the head of parliament because he invites very close associates to sauna, right? And he hates it when it's, it's really like, a, when he invites somebody to sauna, it's really them. There are no bodyguards, nobody's there in the sauna, right? So this guy had the guts of inviting his personal, uh, uh, What's called masseuse, like a male uh, who does massage for him like every day. So he invited him to sauna to go with them. And to Boris Yeltsin, it was a big insult. So according to the bodyguard, it all started with the sauna incident, right? So it didn't start with some kind of conspiracy theory or anything like that, right? So his hair was like a garbage can. He threw that insult of coming to sauna with, with, with another person. And that led to a very important decision of dismissing the parliament, right? So what I'm trying to say that a lot of important decisions are just kind of random, chaotic. There's no concept behind it. There's no thinking behind it. Some people just do things on a whim, right? So that's the garbage can model. So, um, sorry. So the, um, maybe we'll leave that. Okay, so let, let's leave that because uh, next we're gonna talk about next broad, uh, broad topic, which is how exactly technologies can support our decision-making. And, and let's leave it for next class. We'll, we'll discuss it on Thursday. Now, before we wrap up the class, 
session. Let me take attendance. One second, please. Clifton? Yes. Braden? Yes. Nathan? Yes. Devante? I'm Are you the... too? Yeah. Okay. Hello? Oh. Aaron? Here. Jesse? I said uh, it's, it was Aaron David. I think we have a couple. Are you Aaron David? Okay, good. Thank you. Hope? Hope, not here. Sean? Here. Harrison, here. Tristan, here. Violet, here. Thank you. Mason, here. Ahmed, here. Okay, let me go to the other section. Okay, guys, I'll, fee I'll see you on Thursday in the lab. So I'll take attendance in Zoom while you're packing up. Wesley, here. I'm sorry, Wesley, here. Okay, thank you. Aaron Haney, here. Here. Tucker, here. Shanice? Here. Jacob? Here. Caitlin? Caitlin? Not here. Jason? Here. Brandon? Here. Casey? Here. All right, thank you. So I'll go ahead and stop the session if you don't have any questions. No questions, no final comments? All right, well, thank you for joining us today and please join us on Thursday.